what I'm going to talk about today is why 4K lenses are important even if you're not doing 4K. Even if you think 4K is the stupidest thing in the world. And a lot of people do think that. Uh, but let's talk about some options for future of imaging. People talk about spatial resolution. You can see a lot of 8K at the show here. Uh, not just 4K. There's 4K, there's HD, there's still standard def that's going out, and there's less than standard def. People doing things on cell phones and so on. Uh, there's higher frame rate. What does that have to do with lenses? I'll tell you later. Uh, higher dynamic range makes the images pop. Very exciting. And immersive media, 360 degree views, which also have a significant impact on uh, lenses. So I was mentioning about some people thinking 4K is not necessarily the greatest thing in the world. Um, here we have a slide from a network. I'm using it with permission. You can tell from the eye in the background which network it is. And here is one of their other slides. And this is something they've set up in their lab. You can probably get access to it if you want to see it yourself. It's a viewing test with three identical 65-inch screens, one getting HD, one getting HD and up converting it to 4K, and one getting 4K. And on the slide, I've added this little red thing, which is which? And that's the question that people have when they see this. If they stand at normal viewing distances, they really can't tell which is which. Now, in that particular demonstration, they were using um, the same material for all three sets, which means it was the same camera and the same lens, and that makes a pretty big difference. But here are some tests that were done by the European Broadcasting Union, and here you can see uh, the amount of vertical travel is the amount of improvement. So on the left, we're showing uh, in the black line one and a half times the picture height away from the screen. The red line is a fixed 2.7 meters or 9 feet away from the screen. And there's definitely an improvement going to 4K. But it's a very small improvement. If you look at the right, it's a, maybe half a grade of improvement. Um, so you need to do eight times the uncompressed data rate of HD to get half a grade of improvement or 16 times the data rate to get a full grade of improvement. Now, where does that nine feet come from? Well, it's called the Lechner distance. Um, and there's theoretical gobbledygook that you can find on the web about how this is based on viewing angles and scanning lines and interlace and so on. And it was derived from this perceptual information. In fact, uh, that's all garbage. The Lechner distance is nine feet, period. And it was based on a survey that Bernie Lechner did at RCA Labs of the people who work there. And he asked them to measure how far they sat from their uh, TVs and came up with an average of nine feet. Didn't matter what the TV size was, didn't matter what the resolution was, although in those days it was only NTSC. Um, but that's a pretty close match to what Richard Jackson got at uh, Phillips Labs in Red Hill, England, a uh, three meter distance. But does any TV have a fixed viewing distance? You know, maybe you're leaning back and relaxing and just watching something, or maybe you're on the edge of your seat because there's a sports game. Well, I've put a yardstick in there, and you can see that there's about a yard of difference in distance depending on how you're watching. So there is no fixed distance that people uh, sit from their TVs. And Bernie Lechner's distance had nothing to do with resolution, nothing to do with screen size, and so on. But of all that, I say, who cares? Because we don't have a fixed resolution in our vision. People say, oh, human vision, you can see one arc minute. No, you can't. You can see better than that. Look at the stars at night in the sky. The stars are much smaller than one arc minute. Or you can see less than that. It depends on the contrast. So does everybody see a sort of curve under the graph there? OK, I see a lot of heads nodding. Everyone sees a curve. There is no curve there. Your human visual system is putting in the curve. 
you cannot perceive high resolution unless it's high contrast. You also can't perceive very low resolution unless it's high contrast. So what does that mean? Here I have some composite images and uh, I'm going to call on some people in the audience. You, sir, over here. Uh, which person looks angry to you, the person on the left or the person on the right? Okay, he says the person on the left. Somebody way in the back. Does anyone see anything different? You see left also? Okay, step back to that Ikigami booth. Now tell me which one looks angrier. Yeah, now it's the one on the right. Okay, I didn't do anything. You saw my hands the whole time. But they walked back to the Ikigami booth and it changed. Yeah, if anyone wants to get up and walk back and see this for yourselves. But if you don't want to get up and walk, I will uh, change to a smaller image in a moment. I'll just wait for the people who've been walking. Okay, here's a smaller image. By the way, I'll give you a link to these slides at the end of the presentation so you can uh, look it up and play with this at home. Here's a smaller image and now probably everyone sees the angry person on the right. Okay, but me, if I stand right here, I still see the angry person on the left. It's because of the angular resolution and where your contrast sensitivity function falls. So here's what's going on. There's the contrast sensitivity function again. It's a composite image. If you see angry on the left, that's because it's higher resolution. So your uh, contrast sensitivity function is falling in the higher resolution area. If you see angry on the right, that's lower resolution. Uh, the difference, it's about six cycles per degree for angry on the left and two cycles per degree for angry on the right. So a fun parlor trick, um, you can do a movie where different people in the movie theater perceive different things, but who cares? The question is, what does that have to do with 4K lenses? Okay, this is what we have to deal with, scene to scene. We need to shoot what the scene is, and then we need the viewer to see it. And so there's shot stuff, and there's technical stuff, and we're all very good at the technical stuff, but then there's perceived stuff. And not a lot of people at NAB are good at the perceived stuff. So I would like to introduce the concept of ness. This is a suffix to words. Um, you talk about goodness or happiness. Those are clearly human feelings. But when we talk about brightness and loudness and sharpness, those are also human feelings. Those are not technical parameters. So brightness is not the same as light level. You've all seen the optical illusions where the two squares are the same light intensity and yet one appears to be brighter than the other. Um, loudness, how loud something seems to be is not the same as its sound level or volume. Sharpness, how sharp something is, is not the same as focus. So let's discuss that parameter sharpness and where it comes from. Sharpness is based not just on resolution or detail, but on resolution and contrast. And this curve that I'm showing is a fairly typical modulation transfer function curve. So modulation in this case is going from white to black or black to white. It's how much contrast you can get. Transfer is how you get it through the system, from the front of a lens to the back of a lens, from one end of a wire to the other end of a wire, from the scene to the scene. Uh, and function is just showing that this is a graph, that things change with resolution. Now, sharpness is affected by the area under the curve. How affected is it? There are two schools of thought. There's one school that Ari subscribes to, which is that it's just the area. There's another school that Sony subscribes to, which is that it's the square of the area. Uh, I'm not good enough to say with absolute certainty which it is. I lean towards the square of the area, but either way, it's affected by the area under the curve. So what happens uh, with this curve? Well, when Sony introduced HD cam, the first uh, HD uh, camcorder recording format, they couldn't record all of HD's resolution. 
So they did a compromise. They said, okay, we're only going to record up to 1440 in the Luma, the black and white resolution, uh, and only 480 in the chroma, the color resolution, uh, which is like 311 if full HD is 422. But what happens? Well, where that white vertical line is, that's where Sony was cutting off. So what did they cut off? They cut off a substantial amount of resolution, but very little area under the curve. That was the toe of the curve. Could you see the difference? Yeah, you could see the difference. Did it make a big difference? No, because you still had basically all the sharpness. You lost a little bit of area, a lot of resolution, but only a little bit of area. So then Panasonic says, oh yeah, we can do that too. And they go even farther down. They cut off everything above 1280. They're only taking two thirds of the Luma resolution. And yet, HD Cam, I'm uh, sorry, uh, DVC Pro HD, everyone's saying the same thing. Oh yeah, you know, it's fine. It's HD because we still have the bulk of the area under the curve. And that area is really what matters. So what happens with a, uh, an image sensor? Well, all digital, well, all sampled image sensors need to be filtered so that you don't have aliases. And this is the most basic filtering function. It's called the sync function or the sine x over x filter function. Um, the numbers that I've put on here on the horizontal axis, entirely arbitrary. They don't necessarily mean anything. But if that number 11 is 1080 lines, then the contrast at 1080 lines is zero. You're only getting gray. That's zero contrast in HD if you're using an HD sensor. If you use a 4K sensor, if the, um, the number 11 is 2160 lines, now you're getting 64% contrast at HD. That's a huge difference. So going to an oversampled sensor, very, very important. That's why so many people are showing 4K cameras. Let's show what real MTF curves look like. Um, these are Canon SLRs, uh, the EOS 10D versus the EOS 20D. This is ancient history, um, but one was 3072 by 2048 in the sensor. The other one was 3504 by 2336 in the sensor. So a 14% linear increase in resolution, and it's just pushing the shoulder a little bit farther. So what does that look like in real life? Well, here's some text. This is from just a tiny portion of the shot, and you can't read the text because there's not enough resolution for that, but I think everyone will agree that the stuff on the right looks sharper than the stuff on the left. So again, sharpness, very important, and that was just with a 14% increase in uh, linear sensors. So let's look at those viewing tests again. Um, here on the left is that same HD versus 4K viewing test that I showed you. Yes, unquestionably 4K better, but not a lot better. In the middle is going to a higher frame rate. And you can see that the higher frame rate gives you much more bang for the buck. Uh, instead of 16 times the data rate for an improvement of one grade, you get two times the data rate for an improvement of one grade. And then on the right, I have some high dynamic range HDR stuff. And again, you get a tremendous bang for the buck. Anything between zero and maybe 20% increase in data rate uh, for a full grade of improvement. Now I mentioned before, what does high frame rate have to do with lenses? Does the lens care what frame rate you're shooting at? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. Um, because here are some BBC experiments with a higher frame rate. On the left, we have uh, 50 frames or 50 fields per second. Uh, actually, it was 50 frames per second in this particular experiment. And on the right is 300 frames per second. And you can see, without seeing any high frame rate here, you're just looking at still images, that the one on the right looks a lot sharper. Now, the rails and the T's look exactly, the, the ties look exactly the same in both of them because they're not moving, but the locomotive was moving. So you get a higher dynamic resolution. You're getting more static resolution, more sharpness coming out of a higher frame rate. So you need to have that sharpness in the lens to appreciate what the frame rate is doing. So here's an HD lens. Um, 
I don't know why we call it an HD lens. It's for convenience. But notice where it says 100 over there, um, that's HD resolution. That's 100 line pairs per millimeter, which for a two-thirds inch format works out to be HD. But at the far end, I've got 200 line pairs per millimeter. That's 4K. Um, and this HD lens is still responding at 4K. It's got stuff. If I wanted to go to 8K, this HD lens would have something coming out at 8K. A piece of Coca-Cola bottle glass will have stuff coming out at 4K and 8K. Um, there's no such thing as an HD lens or a standard definition lens or a 4K lens, but they're names that we put on for convenience. Um, but notice that not only does the contrast go way down at 4K, even at H HD the contrast is not that great, but as we get farther from the center of the lens, that blue line for example, that's telephoto at far from the center of the lens, that's at 80% of the height. Um, so if we're going to try stitching together images to make immersive media, we're going to have a problem because we're losing the contrast at the edges of the picture. So now there's that same HD lens. HD should probably have quotation marks around it. It's just a lens that was called an HD lens versus a lens that's called a 4K lens. And look at how much more area there is under the curve. So we're getting tremendous amount more sharpness. Now, I've added this white vertical line at 100. That's HD. So ignore everything to the right of that. But look at how much more area you're getting at HD. And that means you're getting more sharpness. So a 4K lens is giving you much sharper HD images. It's making your HD look better. If you're transmitting standard definition, it's going to make your standard definition look better. Now here's a typical zoom lens. Um, it's a high-end lens. If you ask me how do I know it's a high-end lens, this happens to be a Brand X lens. Um, but it's a good lens. And the reason I know it's a good lens is because of all those pieces of glass. Now, why does it have all those pieces of glass? Well, it needs four groups to be a zoom lens, or theoretically needs four groups. One is the focus group, all the way on the left. Um, that's what we use to focus the pictures. One is the relay group, all the way on the right. That takes the image and it puts it on the sensor. And in between, we have the zoom group, that's what magnifies the image, called the variator sometimes. And then we have this other group that's called the compensator. The compensator maintains focus as you're zooming. So when you zoom in, it doesn't get blurry. And sometimes you need pretty complex motion to make that happen. Sometimes the compensator goes in one direction and then goes in the other direction to maintain the focus properly. So that's the four groups, but why do we have all those additional pieces of glass? Well, it's because no single piece of glass can transmit all colors to the same point. So if I have one piece of glass, red is going to show up in one place, blue is going to show up in a different place. Uh, so I need another piece of glass to compensate for that. If I have one piece of glass and it's based on spherical optics, it's going to have something called spherical aberration. It's going to make the pictures fuzzy. So I have more pieces of glass to compensate for that. So there's 36 pieces of glass here, and that's 72 glass surfaces. So let's say I have really good glass, and it transmits 99% of what's hitting the glass per surface. Uh, that sounds pretty good, but if you add up all those surfaces, only 48% is going to make it through all those pieces. Now, this is hypothetical because some of that is not air-to-glass interface, it's glass-to-glass -glass interface, but assuming it was 90% at every one of the surfaces of glass, we've gone down to this horrendous amount of transmission. So, how about we coat the glass with a nice coating? Um, if we do a coating that allows 99.8% to be transmitted, then a little less than 87% is going to get through. Okay, not so bad, 87%, almost twice as much as the 48% that we were talking about before. Um, but what happens to the other 13%? Well, it doesn't disappear, it doesn't get eaten up. It's bouncing around inside the lens. And so it's taking the blacks and turning them into gray. Not such a great thing when you want high dynamic range. So what else can we do? Well, how about we reduce the number of lens elements? 
So instead of using regular glass, we'll use um, some extra low dispersion glass, which is what Fujinon does. Um, now we can maybe get rid of some of that glass that was being used to correct the chromatic aberration. Maybe instead of needing three pieces for that, we can get away with two pieces. Uh, how about instead of using spherical glass, we use aspherical glass to get around the spherical aberration. Now we can maybe get rid of some more of that corrective glass. Well, if we can go from 36 pieces of glass down to 24 pieces of glass, now we have 48 glass surfaces. We've gone from a little less than 87% to more than 90% doesn't sound like a big improvement. You know, we've gotten another 3%, whoop de doo But if you look at the desired light versus the undesired light, for the 90%, it's about a 10 to 1 ratio of desired to undesired. For the less than 87%, it's about a 6.4 to 1 ratio for desired to undesired. That's a much bigger difference than saying 90 versus 87. Can you see this stuff? Yes. Um, I think you people in the audience can notice that the top grading seems to be much more sharp than the bottom grading. There's very, very little difference in contrast between those two, maybe around one or two percent. And yet you can see the increased sharpness even sitting way out there. It's making the grading pop a little bit more. Uh, so it's very important to um, go for a a uh, better lens, because the lens is where you start at the scene, then that goes into your camera, it goes into everything else, and what gets seen will be significantly better. Uh, be happy to answer any questions, and again, these slides are already available at bit.ly slash Fuji hyphen NAB18. Uh, it's a PDF of the slides. And this whole talk will be available at Shubin Cafe and on YouTube uh, shortly, uh, probably a week or two, something like that. Any questions anyone has? <laughs> Sorry, I snowed you. How should we more accurately uh, describe our lenses in? It's a, I know what you're going with there, I, I get that. But, yeah. yeah, it's a, a very good question for which there is no good answer because you know you can talk about super and you can talk about hyper, but once you get to ultra, you can't go beyond that. <laughs> ultra is the same root as ultimate. <laughs> um, so, it's yeah. Like going beyond infinity, how do you do that? Exactly. Yeah. So how is, what is the, uh, how do you convince people? Because, you know, being at Fujinon for 30 years, um, lenses used to be a third of the camera cost, maybe, and now it's easily the other way around. And people that come in 10 years later to buy their cameras, it's kind of a surprise to them. But if this has been going on, it'll continue to go on. You know, yeah, I think idea. that that's the, the wonderful question and the wonderful answer for everyone here who is not with Fujinon is try it, <laughs> look at it, get the lens, shoot something, shoot with your other lens, you decide. Uh, if you can see the difference, then you decide how much that's worth to you. If you can't see the difference, then stay with what you got. And, and but I think you will see the difference and that's what I've found is you can see the difference. And for like a layman, so you say, and, and Fujinon is very good about loading out a product for these tests and so forth, but it, it doesn't mean anything unless the, the tester really is looking, has a 4K monitor, for example, and, or, or whatever. I mean, what would you suggest? How do you, how does the average person see this so readily? Uh, as I pointed out, and what you saw in that previous slide with the grading, it's something you can see even at low resolution. It's something you can see on anything you're shooting. You're going to see that extra sharpness. And sharpness is not resolution. You don't need a 4K monitor. You don't even need an HD monitor. You can see the sharpness on a standard definition set from that extra area, the extra uh, MTF curve area. Because when we went from standard definition lenses to high definition lenses and you would try to 
show on a traditional chart in the corner, wide open, all those challenging uh, parameters to the lens. It, it wasn't as easy to see as it is now on a 4K monitor on, on a chart. You can actually see the lines. You can count them better. But yeah, but again, I say it doesn't matter how many lines you can count. Uh, because there's not a single person who has ever looked at any image, 4K, 8K, anything, and said, oh my, look at all that resolution. What a person says when they see these images and they do something emotionally is, wow, look at that sharpness. Sharpness is a psychological function. It's not a technical function. It's not based on line count. It is based on the area under the MTF curve. The area under the MTF curve gets higher as the camera imager has a higher line count, as the display has a higher line count, as the lens is better. Those all make more area under the MTF curve. But it's not a matter of counting lines. If you're counting lines to decide what lens you should use, then you're not doing it right. You should be looking at pictures to decide what lens you should use. If the picture looks better, that's the lens you need. I have a question. All the lenses you were talking about up there were hitting a flat film plane. You see a day that the film plane is going to change? Uh, it's conceivable. Uh, we, we have the technology already to make a curved plane. Um, I don't know that the advantage is really worth it relative to the cost of manufacture. So we know how to deal with the spherical aberration already pretty well. Um, if we pick up a tiny bit by going to a uh, curved imager, I don't think that's really going to make that much of a difference. Um, but um, would it reduce the size of the lens? Uh, you know, potentially. But going to aspherical optics has done that. Um, there are other things that we can do to maybe improve the lens. By the way, one important thing that I should mention, and it's not specific to any type of lens, um, but it is specific to optics. Um, one limiting factor that we have is diffraction. And you're all familiar with the, the case that as you stop down, uh, you eventually hit the limits of diffraction, everything starts getting blurry. But you're probably not familiar with the fact that other aberrations, or I shouldn't say other aberrations because diffraction is not an aberration, but lens aberrations are worse at wider open apertures. So when you are doing your lens testing or your shooting or whatever, you should find the optimum point at which the diffraction curve and the aberrations curve cross. And for a two-thirds inch format, uh, that tends to be about f4. So f4 is where you want to shoot. Um, and if you're shooting wider open, if it's not because you want to have a soft depth of field, um, then you should probably adjust your lighting so that you're shooting at f4. And if you're shooting at a tighter aperture, then you should adjust your lighting so you're shooting around f4. Um, but it's not the same for all formats. So for two-thirds inch, it's about f4. You can. Uh, find where the issue is for other formats. Can you talk about the adoption rate of the consumers, like what CES projects and what's happening with HD, you know, with 4K? Um, basically, as far as 4K is concerned, every TV that is going to be available is going to be 4K. You're going to have to look hard to find an HD TV in the future because it's just so easy for them to change the manufacturing process to come out with 4K. 4K is not a price object anymore. Um, HDR, a mm, little bit more tricky, um, particularly because there are different technologies involved, LCD versus OLED, for example, and different specifications that are used for those, different forms of HDR that are uh, being uh, transmitted today. We're also going to see some up conversion, both from HD to uh, 4K, as I showed you in the CBS uh, demonstration. They were doing that with one of their sets, but also now there are some excellent techniques for going from standard dynamic range up to higher dynamic range. 
uh, at the HPA Tech Retreat this year, Technicolor was showing some baseball stuff that really struck me as superb conversion from SDR to HDR, and that's going to be occurring in the sets. Um, so can you ignore it completely? Yeah, but the better the stuff that you start with, the better the up conversion is always going to be. Any other questions? Wonderful. Okay, 10.30. There you go. Thank you very much.